welcome to the Do It All Dad Year podcast, dad friendly entertainment for you and me. And this is episode 48. Hugs behind me. My 20 month old son hugs me from behind. We're talking about love of the highest kind. He squeezes daddy with extreme giddy joy. I love you back, kiddo, my perfect boy. So I wanted to call this episode Hugs Behind Me because uh, my son had uh, a major scare last night. I was looking after him, my wife was at work, and I heard uh, wheezing, and it freaked me out. It reminds me of an old joke where I say, uh, God didn't give me uh, three kids to have a panic attack over it. <laughs> Now, I wouldn't say that I was in the middle of a full-blown, out-of-control panic attack last night where I was reaching for an IPA to calm my nerves. Uh, this was not the case. I called my wife, and she, I put the phone on speaker, and I trusted my gut, and my gut told me that something was wrong with my son and his breathing sounded off. I knew he was exhausted, but you know, when you spend as much time as I have uh, with my son, you know when something is off. And I really don't know like how many men in the universe have really spent as much time in the same bed with their son for the extended period of time I have. I wonder if it's a, a Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, I wonder if there's a uh, uh, an inclusion. Because I actually have the Guinness Book of World Records. I don't, maybe I should create my own uh, do-it-all dad Guinness Book of World Record entries as far as most consecutive nights in the same bed with your son. Not necessarily reflecting back on your nerve ridden, swinging 20s versus your snuggling, ultra-content 40s as a whole. But, so it turns out my, my son had, I don't remember the name of his virus, but he like literally got it like yesterday. And my daughter was so funny at the hospital, she goes, Daddy, it's very simple. Samuel has a virus in the lungs. Got it? She is unbelievable. And they gave him steroids and they took care of him. My wife was working that night. So she came home. So we got the kids ready. And uh, we're very fortunate. You know, she works uh, very close by at a hospital. It's about like 15 minutes away. And and uh, I'm at uh, Barnes & Noble today uh, with my son. And both my kids are at school. I actually gave my daughter coffee this morning. I, I took a picture of her with a coffee mug, and instead of saying cheese, I said, all right, Matilda, say, just what? The doctor ordered. And, of course, she makes it sound much more beautiful. So, and she did take a couple of sips of my uh, dark roast uh, coffee. Uh, and she actually was able to take, test. Uh, I'm sorry, tasting notes compared to an espresso that I've offered her a taste of in the past as well. So it was a very uh, mature, sophisticated uh, a moment on my daughter's behalf uh, that I'll always remember. And then so about the bookstore, this is later, and my son does his hug from behind, where you know, uh, I never see it coming. It's like a beautiful, spontaneous, like, love hug, lunge. <laughs> and he grabs my calf and he sticks his head uh, underneath my legs and... Uh, Sometimes I give him like a scissor lock, and uh, it, it really is, uh, you know, true. Uh, it's a true love blanket, and uh, it's an amazing feeling. And I, I wish uh, that any guy that I've ever liked being with, which would basically not include 99% of most bartenders, <laughs> uh, or for friends that I do have a deep affections for, that I have professed my love for, uh, if they have not had that opportunity, I, I pray that they do. So I'm going to start praying for that. I'm going to start praying to God for my friend David Uger to have the experience of having a kid 
at some point that's his that can love the totality of him because I know that you know Dave if he had a kid would really uh, give that kid his all you know he has a similar father to me where you know he can be very disparaging and, and basically a total dickhead well, at least they're on speaking terms so but um, I love you Dave we haven't talked like in the past week and a half but uh, your uh, continued support and interest in this podcast and advice along the way has been phenomenal. So uh, conserv- this is a conservative talk radio great Michael Savage interviewing Ziggy Marley. It's Dr. Savage. Uh, studies prove, Ziggy, that uh, excessive weed use lowers your sperm count. Ziggy Marley replies, my father had 12 kids. Fake news, man. Michael Savage's follow-up interview question for Ziggy Marley. Ziggy, did you know 420, like your national pot smoking day? Did you know that 420 is actually Hitler's birthday? Is that something else, Ziggy? Huh? But right now you're thinking, hits from the bong never felt so wrong. Or you don't think so tough gong. Huh? You think I'm a total square over here because I'm a conservative talk radio pundit, New York Times bestseller, Arthur. You don't think I can throw in a good tough gun label? You don't think I'm capable of that? Zig! So, I saw Ziggy Marley twice. Uh, Both times with my brother, actually. One was in Central Park and another time was at the Roseland, which they closed. Lady Gaga, the last show there, because Lady Gaga went from doing small venues like in Lower Side to like Masquerade Garden. And uh, for all those not familiar with uh, the, the Roseland, that was like a middle tier, probably like 3,000. You know, Metallica, you know, played there back in the day. So Bjork there. She was actually pretty angelic. Uh, I've never struck out more trying to find weed in my entire life. Okay, that, that, that was the most sober-minded concert going quite I've ever been to. My wife puked in her purse that night. Uh, I'm taking the Metro North back. I was, a nice moment, but uh, Bjork was awesome. Um, I, I always bust her balls, but oh, and, and my daughter can't stand her. She's like, "Daddy, like get like the shrieking, uh, the shrieking eel, you know, uh, lady uh, off Cortana now." <laughs> before I tell Cortana to throw, before I tell Cortana to throw herself in the window and take me with her, <laughs> because my ears are bleeding, and I want the electric eels out. They were eating my brain. But, so, and I met Ziggy Marley when I was in California. I lived in the Oakwood Apartments in Burbank, which I loved. I used to crash the Burbank Oakwood Apartments. What do I mean by that? Is that they had the best pool. And when I lived in West Hollywood, I did not have a pool in my apartment building. This was not Melrose Place. So, even though I did live right down the street from the Common Improv off of Melrose. And turns out that all of those... Um, all the gear, all of the the wardrobe, you know the, uh, you know when you think of the uh, the fashion, synonymous with synonymous with hair metal, all those guys, Stephen Percy from Rat, Brett Michaels, uh, Vince Neil, Motley Crue, uh, Tom Kiefer, the Whip Fuller legends from Philly, uh, they they all went to, like the same uh, boutique uh, on Melrose, which I think is really cool. Melrose is the only area in LA uh, that has some semblance of foot traffic. I mean, of course, you know, Sunset does, but, and obviously it was much crazier back in the day, uh, you know, especially, you know, uh, pre-AIDS, uh, you know, before, uh, you know, magic made uh, HIV disappear. I have to burp at seltzer. <coughs> Sorry about that, folks. So, but I used to live uh, on Harper Street, uh, so like right down the street from the Sunset Strip. It was like a decent walk up, but not really. Uh, first it was Santa Monica and then Sunset, or the, I think Fountain then Sunset. But anyway, uh, I remember my old boss saying, "Hey, hey, J.K., you want to meet at the Mondrian?" I'm like, "Yeah, sure, I can walk there." He's like, "What is it with you and like walking everywhere?" So, so it was a nice badge of honor being a uh, native New Yorker uh, that I am. And of course, the weather was always phenomenal, so why wouldn't I want to walk and, uh, and, and 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 bust out the leather? So, I was talking about Ziggy. So I met Ziggy one time at uh, the Oakwood Apartments. I was playing basketball 
Um, I used to love playing basketball. Uh, I used to play with my friend Jordan, who's now a very successful uh, documentary filmmaker. Uh, he went to Ithaca with me, otherwise known as Cornell's retarded next door neighbor. And it was really cool. He had me read uh, Dharma Bums uh, by Jack Kerouac. I never read it before. And he actually gave me Catching the Rye, which I like, totally forgot about. And I remember like, the impression it made as far as like it being like a readable book of fiction, but like that was pretty much it. And that was really cool, Jordan. So I love you for that, man. And because I'm you know, now on this uh, writing, you know, fiction, you know, path myself. Uh, I was obviously I've been in the, and he I started doing poetry uh, as well. I remember uh, back in the day, he like stopped smoking weed, basically pulled a uh, John Coltrane, just you know, really got into a full blown uh, spiritual uh, attunement mode, and uh, he's done very well. So uh, I love you, Jordan, and uh, we play ball. Um, I, I had. My game was a tad more impressive than Jordan, but, you know, I was a little bit stronger. But, you know, Jordan good moves. He could create off the dribble. And uh, he always got a kick out of me. I always made him laugh. And his older brother was a real pimp daddy. He went to Muhlenberg. Uh, always dressed really well. And uh, so so Ziggy, so I see Ziggy at the Oakwood Apartments. Uh, and understand, like, this is, like, where all these kids go for, like, pilot season. And, you know, Warren Zevon lived there one time. Artie Lang would try to kill himself, so... It can be a, t a tad depressing for certain stars where, you know, everything looks the same. But for me, like, you know, when you're from, like, New York, it's, like, constant paradise. And, uh, you know, it's because you got the pool, you got the jacuzzi, you got good lucky women, you got models, you have the uh, the fashion students. And you, you had Emerson, uh, which, uh, you know, Gina Gershwan went there, Dennis Leary, Norman Lear, Mario Cantone. So we had the Emerson students and the Ithaca students. Um, I had my first half ass menage a trois with two Emerson students, actually, uh, which reminds me for the uh, it's appropriate thing to mention for the Do It All Dad Your podcast is that the if you're don't even bother with the menage a trois if you're piss poor at multitasking, yeah, <laughs> because if and especially if you're already hooked up with one girl, but you really want to hook up with the other girl just because she was from Spain, even though they hate Jews there and had no tits, she had no tits, even though the other one did, and she was from Texas and was a Jewess and was like really cool and funny. But yet, like, you're into, like, the girl from Spain because she's, she's, like, cute and she seems more exotic and intelligent, like, which she wasn't. And, like, you focus on that girl and then, you know, the other girl just, you know, she's like, well, what about me? And I'm just going to type on the laptop right now or while well, you slog away, you know, trying to, uh, you know, create some uh, boom boom magic. So, uh, it was a total squatter opportunity. Boy, I messed that up. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Dad, for that conversation. You know, this is the guy that was in a fraternity. He tells me he was a member of the House of Soul in college and... You know, he, he sold weed and acid and, and the college and the, the bank of Lake Forest to get involved because he was such a big baller. Meanwhile, this is, of course, the age of free love. No conversations about multitasking, the menage, the birds and the bees, STDs. Goonish! You're always that busy at work, Pops! You're home at 6.30! I know he had a schlep over the GW, but you were home 6.30, had your dinner every night. You weren't entertaining us kids. You weren't teaching us Jack. You weren't helping us with homework. I enjoyed the fraternity stories. Like that one time, which was a very mean fraternity story, but funny. To an adolescent, where you had to invite the ugliest girls. And some guy brought a girl with no arm, which is like insanity. Pretty uh, crazy story to tell a kid. But... I referenced that story in my Heavy Metal High uh, pilot trilogy. Something you guys should check out on the uh, Dear Donna website. Uh, it, it really I poured my heart and soul into that while looking after my firstborn. <clears throat> Think I'd be made in the shade and have a huge compound in Westchester right now, being able to afford 25 grand in property tax a year. <laughs> that is not the case. So, I was talking about Ziggy Marley, and so I see Ziggy Marley, and it's definitely Ziggy Marley. He looks like Bob, he sounds like Bob. I, uh, and I, I talked to one of his handlers. I'm like, is that Ziggy? He's like, he's like, yeah, man. And then I remember hanging out with my friend Aaron. I've talked to Aaron in ages. I love you too, Aaron. The, uh, Aaron got me into all these biographies, uh, like Michael Eisner and Ovitz, and really got me, my, my brain stimulated about the idea of like working in show business. There was this girl that I had hooked up with. We, you want to talk about chemistry, not being meant to be, like our teeth clanged. Uh, she now like, lives in some like farm like uh, up in like Sonoma. Uh, and we lived together at one point. Uh, her name is Becca. Um, I love you too, Becca. <laughs> I'm amazed at all these people from my past that just like keep on coming out of the blue. 
who I actually ran into this girl back there. I went to Ithaca with. We hooked up in college. She goes, listen, I think you should work for like a talent agency. I'm like, okay, it's a good idea. It's like an advertising PR major. The most squandered opportunity of all time. You know, parents spend God knows what. You know what? Forty. I don't even know what they spent at Ithaca. I'm a communication major. I did not. Meanwhile, I had a radio show at Lake Forest prior. I uh, did some like half-ass Howard Stern like wannabe refs uh, routines, and we played like I had like literally 30 minutes. I would play a 24-minute work and pose, and uh, you know, I throw my Wilson pick here. That was great, everything, but I didn't. I was very half-ass in terms of my preparation. I also had pretty minimal confidence in terms of being this like really like hilarious entertainer like back then, or at least like the potential. And but I did make the decision to transfer colleges because I. I Realized that the Midwest was not for me. Uh, the only time, I, first time in my life, I became like painfully aware of uh, the limitations of my uh, self-conscious, overtly putsy Jewish, uh, Eastern bred personality. <laughs> Did not always play well, <laughs> the, uh, which is really comical in retrospect. But. Um, but I, I did have lots of friends, you know, in, in college. A lot of them flunked out uh, freshman year uh, and didn't come back. And I did have the distinction of uh, I hooked up with a couple of sophomores uh, freshman year. It was a small school too. I mean, very like a thousand undergrads. So that was nice. Uh, but I still didn't lose my virginity, you know, until uh, sophomore year. So yeah, that's pretty brutal. Again, especially when you have a younger brother that loses his virginity before you, who's three years younger than you. And my younger brother also hit puberty for it. So understand, my brother banged the three hottest girls in his ninth grade class that I tried to jerk off to at the time but couldn't, <laughs> which would make anyone feel like a big brother bust of the most uh, biblical proportion, right? It's like the ultimate double whammy of shame. So my brother says, oh, you made up for it. Stop, compl stop complaining about it. I'm like, that's easy for you to say. Very easy for you to say. So I was so Ziggy. So I'm mentioning Aaron and... So we're hanging out with Aaron. We smoked a lot of weed together. Uh, but we really got into Family Guy. We talked about writing a screenplay together. We never did. It was all talk. <laughs> then other you know, things you're really honest about with your kids as far as marijuana use is that it definitely uh, tends to produce the ability for uh, you to talk a lot of smack and not really uh, you know, do a lot of doing. Uh, and it definitely does take away from the totality of your uh, productivity output. Now, in the past, whenever I wrote my scripts, my spec scripts for Always Sunny and he spun it down, you know, the ganja was always a, uh, a reward. And uh, so it was a pretty powerful motivator. And, uh, and also, I would always notice that after I got stoned, reading the scripts, they'd really come to life. Because, you know, in a spec script, you want to paint the picture. You want to be able to visualize the action. I was very good at that. And, again, you know, folks, why am I doing this podcast? You know, P.T. Barnum says... The only way to achieve greatness in life is to do something that caters to your natural strengths, gifts, faculties, and ability. And for me, obviously, the gift of gab I have. Uh, it's a natural extension of who I am. I wasn't always that guy. I was a shy guy. I need to do an episode on how I overcame the shy guy. How did I do that? Well, hooking up with a couple of Israeli girls uh, during my Masada teen tour helped out tremendously. Again, younger brother. He's banging chicks left and right. I got goonish. Uh, I'm going to camp. Another canteen mixer gone. I choose to stay in my bunk and touch myself, and I can't even like you know release uh, juices to joy. Reading Crack magazine, I'm working on like basketball lateral moves. Kids are laughing at me. Uh, I just thought, why am I going to go to a canteen mixer? You know, all, all the jappy boys are going to hook up with the girls, the big tits anyway, and you know, and they'd be like, smell my finger, and they all got pubic hair, and I had goonish, second worst athlete after the kid, uh, the chic son from Great Neck. So I'm like, what am I going to do over there? But Anyway, I would say at a very early age, I had been very comfortable uh, being by myself. Uh, I mean, I used to go to Burger King by myself. One time I was at Lake Forest, and I was eating by myself, and this guy sat with me. He was in my philosophy class, philosophy and film. He's like, and he goes, well, why sit by myself? Why not? It's not a big deal. And he goes, well, you should have to sit by yourself. So, uh, his name was Matt. Uh, he's a good guy. But uh, never had a problem with that. I think it's because my one of the reasons why I've gravitated towards much towards the TV scripts when um, Erica... Uh, my old girlfriend in L.A. introduced me to this concept, saying, hey, you know, you could write for TV for a living. And she worked for this aid, literary agency called Kaplan Thaler. And they represent this guy, David Angel, who died during 9-11. He was a showrunner on, on Frasier. So we did some Malcolm in the Middle scripts, Curb Enthusiasm. Early feedback was that I, I had a good feel for drama. Uh, hadn't really developed my, uh, you know, s sense of funny, you know, yet. 
uh, I've you know worked pretty hard on you know since. You know, understand, folks. You know, I started writing. I started getting lost in, or started dreaming of being a paid professional scribe in the biz since I was twenty four. Now I'm forty two. So obviously, um, I don't give up easy. Uh, you know, writing for VH1 Classic, you know, is great and everything. You know, writing intros for Chris Jericho. But I was writing, like, full-blown scripts, you know, before that. I mean, when I was in my 20s. And I would also, like, after... Usually the hard part, and Eric gave me a hard time for this, I would take a, a longer time than most to generate the ideas for the actual stories. But, you know, once I had that, you know, it would take me, like, a month. But, you know, once uh, I... And I always subscribe by the, the philosophy of Walt Disney, which I learned later, which is the original idea phase. To just throw a bunch of stuff against the wall. And then, you know, pick and choose and be selective. But, you know, the key great writing advice here, folks, is just don't edit yourself and don't be afraid to look stupid, uh, you know, especially during brainstorming, you know, stages. So you've got to keep on generating ideas and ideas. And I remember when I became a recommended writer on 30 Rock, and this is literally like 12 years later after I started writing Specs with Erica, I remember at Park Slope, literally writing out shorthand. You know, what if Jenna did this? What if Jenna did that? And, and it all paid off. So, you know, because I placed third in this contest, the person that won um, was like already working in Always Sunny Philadelphia. So, you know, again, I I, uh, I didn't read the script. I can't, you know, compare. Uh, but again, that was great industry validation. And I never had it. At that point, I just felt like a, a total imposer interloper in Brooklyn trying to establish my artistic cred. Uh, I just got fired from a headhunting job, but I had gotten this gr biggest commission check ever, like seven grand. I asked my mom, she worked for JP, uh, JP Morgan, and I said, Mom, give me the word chart for JP Morgan Hedge Fund Services. I did it, cold call, meeting, found the guy, posted an ad. Uh, it was Max Gabriel. Max Gabriel, I love you. The, uh, he's super big time now, Came CIO, CTO, entrepreneur. Uh, he's always read my scripts. Max, I haven't seen you in ages. We had a great meal at the Oyster Bar not too long ago. We treated. Uh, real class act. And so. But with Max, I'll never get that phone call. That was so great. As far as working in sales, I get a phone call from HR. I'm like, okay, he so did not want to talk to me. He goes, okay, so how much is it, how much is it going to cost? What, 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 what's the magic number? I said 150k, nothing less deal. And then it was like you know a huge commission check. But I got fired. But my uh, old boss Ed, he was like a new boss. He made sure that I got the commission check. So I was literally able to uh, throw myself into my writing um, after that, and I was getting unemployment. And then I wrote the third rock. So uh, then maybe the recommended writer, which was great. Uh, parents never asked to read that script, but and it's definitely the most half-assed toast of all time. And they tried to show that they really gave a shot, uh, gave a shit, <laughs> gave a shot, gave a shit. The uh, at their house one time, boy was that pathetic. But so you know, I know I was talking about Ziggy. So there's Ziggy, and I'm hanging out with Aaron, and we're at the Oakwoods, and he goes. Ziggy, outside. I said, get him. And he hounded down Ziggy. And he got a picture of me and Ziggy Marley. Oh, I'm so pissed. Another reason I have to smoke weed on a regular basis. I, I don't know what happened to that photo album, but it's gone. And it was the best picture. It was such a good picture of me and Ziggy. Uh, but I, I picture in my mind right now. And it makes me smile. And I'm really glad uh, Aaron was a part of that. You know, Aaron, you know, now he, he's... Ended up working as like a writer for like uh, Penn and Teller, and so uh, he was always very sharp, very studious, uh, and he was younger than me. You know, some of my friends gave him a hard time. So he's uh, a tad nerdy, but uh, you know, I, I always liked him. I, I liked the style. I, I liked that you know he was very well read, and uh, you know, he, he was a good friend to me. So and, and his brother, I, I lived with in L.A. I mean, he was I don't know anybody. I remember Dan saying, "Josh, I, I know why you smoke a lot of weed because like you don't have any friends." <laughs> So I got a kick out of that. Uh, so Dan would work for Mad TV as a writer's assistant. Said, so, you know what, I don't want to do this, and went to law school. And he's got a very pretty wife. He's got kid, very good looking kids. So uh, he, he he's done well. So I, I love you too, Dan. You know he, he was my, my roommate out there, and um, he was very good to me. He actually put me on my first job out there for World Wildest Place Videos. I was a uh, production assistant. The uh, so uh, thank you for that, Dan. Because if you don't do that, I don't set in LA. I don't end up, you know, getting a. Uh, I don't end up, you know, working in headhunting eventually, and I don't meet Erica, and I don't start writing scripts, and you know, because of Erica, you know, she gave me the idea of becoming more than just a schmuck in a headset, and uh, she 
you know, taught me that I could, that I have a real talent in this world that uh, made me feel unique. And I never really felt like truly unique before. Outside of being like, you know, the funny guy that came out of his shell, you know, he started smoking weed and had some beers. So uh, I love you, Erica, for that, and Dan, and Aaron, and Jordan. All people from my past, I haven't talked to them in ages. Uh, unbelievable. Pause in thoughts, they fade, fade away. Hearts and thoughts, they fade, fade away. I swear I recognize your breath. <laughs> I really need to sing uh, Pearl Jam for karaoke. I haven't done that yet. So one of my earlier open mics in L.A., and we were talking, not many, and it was a really cool venue. It was like outdoors, and there's this guy, I don't know, he was like so tiny. And I said, let's get, up, let's get up for the kid from the Jeremy video, and everyone laughed. And I was, again, I mentioned before, every time I've gotten to laugh at from the very beginning, I've always had good sets, never bombed. And uh, I did this bit about, I had a conversation with God, and I was talking about Jews, you know, treat God, the relationship with God like it's a booty call. And I I met this this woman afterwards, she complimented He always remembered the compliment. She's like, yeah, that's very impressive. So that was literally like me being experimental like my first year. So uh, that, uh, that felt good because I definitely did not get many compliments that first year. So... The, uh, I, I was talking about weed a lot here in this episode. I'm talking about uh, uh, Ziggy. So uh, this is a note from a crazy good dad at lunch column. Dad is my daughter. Uh, Shannon's mom makes the best brownies. Shannon thinks peanut butter would be a yummy filling. Uh, my reply, uh, Matilda, just lay up brownies with weed in it when you get older, okay? Weed brownies are total creepers. Uh, you won't know whether you'll be flying or dying. <laughs> I've also uh, experienced full-blown weed blackouts in Mardi Gras and uh, where else? In Amsterdam. Yeah, so that's a real thing. So I don't understand why, I don't, why people do space cakes. It makes no sense to me at all. And uh, it doesn't taste good. Half the fun for, you know, for me and Puff and the Ganj, what I did was uh, the taste, the communal, uh, the, the communal thing, you know, just the taste and, you know, take in like a one-hitter. You know, I used, my favorite thing is Taking one hitters in Manhattan, like hanging in a bar, going outside, taking a one you know, you know, really letting the imagination run wild, thinking, oh, I could actually be a functional, working, pothead creative and be in the whitest guild of America already. Uh, that has not happened yet. Worked for TV twice, but it was a non guild signatory. It's okay. Uh, I'm not going to get into that right now. So, uh, this is my elusive moneymaker idea. Open up a speakeasy milk bar in Bushwick and offer old school straws for greater bubble blonde power, which will be considered contraband like Cubans before you know it. <laughs> it's me trying to dress today uh, with my baby boy Samuel. Uh, my hugs from behind kid mentioned earlier. My lucky number three, who's 20 months old. And everyone is ooing and aahing about him. You know, I, first they mentioned my curls, I go, Chosen Curls is uh, his new nickname after Headbangers Ball. And then uh, they, they mention the eyes. I'm like, oh, the eyes, yes. Billy Corgan is penning an oceanic song about them as we speak. And then I decide to, I, I'm getting some laughs, and I decide to go for the uh, the kill. And out of nowhere, and this is like a much older woman, she's definitely a grandma. I say, my baby, uh, my baby boy, uh, you know, when you take into consideration his James Spader hair and future Vince Vaughn height. I tend to get confused with like Vince Vaughn pre insomnia the outcome six for myself. So just want to set the context here folks. So I say my baby boy with his James Spader hair and future Vince Vaughn height will require a lawyer at all times to supervise uh, the signing of pre poundage forms on my son's behalf. <laughs> and the grandma laughed a long time. So this is me at the uh, Hayfield today. It's this really nice farm. Uh, they have like great sandwiches and like great beer, which I can't drink anymore, at least for the next three months. That's the new game plan, folks. I totally regress. I had learned last night that uh, my Dr. Altman was not lying and that for 6'4", that you're basically considered fat or above your, your weight when you're above 200. So I was on the 205 and I thought, oh, that's great. But no, like I do need to be at like 195. And 210, which I'm at now, is too much. So, and I totally feel it, uh, like my lack of elevation, which I worked so hard to build this summer doing box jumps. So disgusted with myself, but uh, I will dunk for my children, and that's going to happen this year. We lose to 20, and it's going to be great. And then I can start enjoying. 
beer again. And it, the stay at home comedian was a bestseller. Who do mind enjoying the ganj once in a blue moon away from my kids? But maybe with my editor. I could have like that relationship that like Jason Schwartzman has with his uh, uh, publisher, uh, Ted Danson, <laughs> in the big city. Wouldn't that be nice? So uh, this is a conversation I had at uh, Hayfields, the uh, fancy, swanky uh, farm uh, nursery get up here in North Salem. So there's uh, a guy, older dude, he's wearing a Red Sox hat. He's like waiting for his like, sausage, egg, and cheese. So I decided to bust balls and I said, so I didn't catch the game last night, but uh, I'm assuming uh, Stephen King wasn't caught uh, bringing stop mass hysteria out to the ball game. <laughs> Great joke. Uh, for those that didn't get that, and fuck you, Michael Savage, for not responding to that. Obviously, you know, you say you're into sports. Uh, you're probably not into sports, but Stephen King always brings books to ball games. And that was a great joke in your honor. And I bought your book today. And for the record, your publisher, for the talk of getting maximum premium placement, was in the bottom shelf. Had a struggle finding it, okay? You know, the, uh, I am a uh, too tall Jew over here, all right? You know, like my son had a hard time finding it. So definitely want to have a conversation with that publisher, which I also included in Pointer now in the text today, uh, the text in the tweet that I sent to you. Danbury, Barnes & Noble, Danbury, Dr. Savage, okay? Lower placement, all right? Lower, all right? Impossible to see, like troll level, okay? So uh, my mom um, hates being compared to Sylvester Stallone. After I mentioned how he still does his own stunts at 73, <laughs> my mom freaks, well, I'm not sly. It's an unfair comparison, Mom, you know, knowing how you poop out from babysitting for two hours on a lazy Sunday, no offense. So uh, trusting my gut saved my toddler from brain damage, talking about Samuel again. So again, last night, just a little backstory. Uh, for those of you just tuning in, for those that fast forward, uh, my baby boy Samuel, 20 months old, starts wheezing uh, like Hillary Hammer time cankles down one flight on the Spanish steps. Uh, I call my nurse wife uh, to express concern. We go to the ER. Turns out my son had a virus in his lungs. And now uh, Samuel is loving me more than mama back to normal again. <laughs> Metal pride in the house. This is so funny. Four-year-old son declares to seven-year-old sister, I'm metal. You're Lady Gaga. Big sis says, I'm Lady Gaga with Metallica. You're the singer from Annie. <laughs> Told you so. Do it all, Dad. Halloween tip. Stay inside and play dress up with your kids and hang up an ISIS flag outside your home to scare away other trick-or-treaters. <laughs> this is me working on uh, my reframing skills. My wife isn't emoting about my new nicknames for our kids. Jim Jr. for our son Arthur Morrison Cornbluth, if he's rocking the leather, and Courtesy for Matilda after she makes four jump shots in a row on the big boy hoop. Because, obviously, my wife uh, lacks my uh, nurturing super special touch. <laughs> Uh, Twitter, can't lock my account over this remark. Fuck you, Trump, for giving my tweet pick three kids hugging flags inspired by your previous patriotic act, goonish. My tweet had a heartwarming message to boot. Are you a, a fake news patriot like Bush hopping out of planes now? My chest. Again, Twitter can't lock my account over this. Fuck you, Trump, for giving my tweeted pick and my three kids hugging flags nothing. Also means goonish. I've only ended 20 year friendships, formed hatred in my parents' hearts, and ruined any shot of ever getting a white collar interview again defending you. No big deal. So me in the kitchen uh, cleaning when uh, this was uh, on Sunday when uh, my wife was off. This is supposed to be my, my work day, my wife says. Are you done banging? Is my reply. Uh, the cutting board. Uh, I was I was cleaning slipped. What was the aggressive clang too upsetting to bear? <laughs> it's my wife ruining uh, Sunday bagels. The first bite of salmon was off, so I couldn't enjoy the rest. I feel the same way about your dad's wedding speech. And every time he's opened his mouth since, you have a good sense of direction. We get her already. 
really appreciate the uh, complete non-mention in his speech altogether and him doing recycled material that is older than Yiddish. Uh, but he's supposed to be the, uh, the deep genius one because he's Irish and everyone from Ireland apparently has that, uh, that deep poetic side that uh, some people just are obviously you know, better at uh, articulating than others. So American Dad, no. I never text picks. So what, what do I mean by that? Yeah, this is just advice for dads, okay? All right? So never text your friends, college, work, whatever, right? Because you don't a long time, okay? Never text them pictures of your flowering offspring hugging American flags. Never send those pictures to unmarried buds in the early 40s ever, <laughs> all right? Because no response they ever give is good enough, all right? It's just it's too much forced passing reality to adjust in one take. <laughs> it's an asshole line, but you know, it's just the reality. Uh, so uh, this is uh, me and my wife talking about uh, Dr. Savage again. This is me. I say, Dr. Savage has all the rampant feasties and fleas in the streets of San Francisco. Can cause the next plague. My wife says, at least you don't listen to Rush Limbaugh. And uh, I say... Uh, Rush Limbaugh, this compound in West Palm Beach is huge. Your dad will co-sign on a loan. Yay! I can't think no more. <laughs> Long live Dice. By the way, how great is Dice? He's in the new film with Lady Gaga. plays the father. He's like, I'm going to retire on top. I've worked with Scorsese on the vinyl. I work with Woody. Uh, and I'm not going to judge. And now I'm boys of Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. I'm done with film. I'm just going to focus on my podcast and being a comedy legend and dive into more deeper material uh, and for coming up with more scenarios for uh, weeping out my dick. So, you know how long it is waiting in line at the bank. So, work on my reframing again. My wife assumed I was ordering her to make a hummus sandwich from scratch after my daughter's request to pack a picnic for their hike to the lake because of the pushy IT recruitment culture, which shaped the man I am today. <laughs> Again, uh, so there's another conversation I have with the wife. Uh, I say, so the Chinese have stolen, I was reading the New York Post, I decided this information in the New York Post. I, I've always been aware of the Chinese hacking and everything, and them stealing our intellectual uh, property, it's apparently the original left to develop themselves. Uh, the Chinese have stolen two, this is what I tell my wife, the Chinese have stolen 225 billion dollars worth of intellectual property from us. My wife says, the Russians are just as bad. Sure. In like 1985, babe, when slogans like, you suck my battleship, ruled the commercial airwaves pre-fake news. Gen X in the house! Can I get a holla for some holla? It's my daughter. Daddy. Trump is older than Papa? Wow. Papa looks awful compared to him. <laughs> and I, I, I tell my daughter, well, yeah, having good hair helps. You know, the root of Papa's hate for me is me making him bald prematurely in his early 20s. I'm sure of it. <laughs> Funny think of Hillary, how much time can as a former first lady anymore. I, I thought ladies could handle their wine and not require spill handlers. I bet Reese Witherspoon can balance pride and prejudice on her head after a bottle of white burgundy. <laughs> that is the most pretentious joke of all time, but it's very funny, and it's a, a great detail. So, And just to educate over here, because I sold wine for a little bit when I was in L.A., uh, my territory was Pasadena and Burbank. Don't get jealous, because I was working in commission. I had no money. I was an idiot. My father didn't teach me anything. I ended up paying all this money on capital gains taxes, because I had to basically cash my bar mitzvah stocks, because I was working on pure commission. And I made, and I did some sales, but I basically made enough to pay for a sprayed uh, dime bag of weed from the Bronx that tastes like Windex. So don't get too jealous there. But I did learn enough to know that uh, white burgundy is uh, the Chardonnay, talking about the Chardonnay, the, the Guineos Chardonnay grape of uh, the Burgundy region in France. So, and that is also the prominent grape they use in Champagne. So uh, just throwing it out there. and. Uh, so, that's that. The best wine I had when I went to wine tastings ever was a Cab Franc, which usually uses a blending grape in Bordeaux. Uh, very few American producers grow it by itself, but uh, it's a very expressive grape. On par, you would like, let's say, a Shiraz or a Zinfandel. 
uh, a gamay, uh, also a uh, petite sirah. So, but like, really, but just as peppery as all those. And this is a three hundred dollar bottle of a uh, cabernet franc, and I've never had a sip of wine that. I literally gagged on the. Um, I mean, it, it was so strong and overloaded with flavor, right? Like it even would make like Lexington Steel blush. <laughs> so uh, this is my seven-year-old daughter taking, uh, talking down to her elitist uh, grandmother in Arizona, retired in Scotts, Arizona. This is my seven-year-old daughter talking down to Mimi, her elitist grandmother, like an unsophisticated deplorable. Strawberry ice cream is a baby ice cream flavor, Mimi. <laughs> It's my daughter last Saturday night. Daddy, I'm bored with uh, rock and roll. And I tell her, because uh, we're watching uh, a bunch of... Uh, I showed her that uh, Lady Gaga uh, performance with Metallica at the Grammys on the YouTube. We never did that on the, on the big screen before. So, I'm watching some other clips. My, my daughter says, Daddy, I'm bored with rock and roll. Uh, and I tell you, Eddie Van Halen does sound repetitive on a 12-minute version of Eruption. I agree. So I went to, uh, this is another poem, uh, it's a quickie, <laughs> and it's called Effin' Damn It. Uh, no more boob, uh, my wife screams with utter disgust. But I thought breastfeeding fed baby Samuel self-esteem off the wazoo, and was a total must. Effin' Damn It, baby, stop interrupting my sleep. Stop being a, a bitch about it, and they'll make... Less of a peep. Oh! And this poem is called My Son's Favorite Things to Do. After a brief respiratory scare, hugging Dada from behind again to show love for his Dada, making him feel like a perfect. 10. I am so glad, Samuel, uh, to have you back to full strength. I did not have a total panic attack last night. Again, God did not give me three children to have a panic attack over it. He gave me you three, and especially you. You know you weren't planned. <laughs> uh, he gave me you so I could prove to myself that I'm not a waste of height, like my father tried to label me. You could say he's busting my balls, but I'm not going to apply those restrictive labels you know, to my children. And I'm not going to make them sound like it's a you know, predetermined you know, fate that they have no control over. But it's up to me to prove that I was born to rise to the challenge and make the stay-at-home comedian book a monster success. The next book we write Birth of a Pescatarian Comedian, Pescatarian Diet, plus Heapings of Funny equals one happy family. I want to make this family happier, stronger, funnier, and more successful than ever. It's all on Daddy's shoulders. Uh, I want to thank my beautiful, perfect wife, Natiana Duffy. First night we met, walking in Manhattan, she told me to uh, push my shoulders back. And you can say she's as a whole, uh, straightened me out uh, ever since. And I uh, really appreciate that, babe, and I really appreciate your uh, consistent belief in me. And uh, I don't think you've ever been more excited about uh, my new vision to finally make this happen, now that I have 0, 0.0 desire to uproot the family and move to Rapewood in California just to write for Family Guy amongst another 20-so million musketeers that I can buy and sell daily that have never made a cold call in their life. Uh, that have 0.0, .0 personality uh, off the page. <laughs> uh, this is the Do It All Dad Year podcast, uh, dad friendly entertainment for you and me. Controlling our kids through comedy on the remote work front can make our kids great again. And I'll talk to you guys soon. <laughs>